Andrew Bowerbank. Thank you so much for coming to Heenan Blakey's second annual Earth Week event. Pleasure. Well, we have a few questions to ask you tonight. And first of all, you, uh, you were head of the World Green Building Council for a number of years, and now you founded EC3 Initiative. Can you tell me, what does EC3 Initiative do? Why did you feel the need to found that particular organization? Sure, um, EC3 stands for Energy, Climate, Communication and Collaboration. And really it was my effort um, to take all the work that I've been doing over the past number of years with World Green Building Council and as a member representative of the United Nations and bring a, a, an opportunity to showcase Canadian leadership a little bit better internationally. And one thing I've been doing in all my travels is noticing that you know, the Canadian perspective is really not as strong as I feel it should be. But then also looking at internally saying that there's a lot of work that needs to be done ourselves in and amongst the efforts that we do, uh, strategies, uh, cross-sector collaboration. It's something that really is uh, falling on the wayside. There's almost opportunities that you see between people's mindset of, of what green is about. Green really is that, a mindset. It's a marketing tool, a lifestyle choice. We have to look at what the economics of those choices are really about, how do businesses start to capitalize on that in order to transform a marketplace. So EC3 is the mechanism to bring people together in a neutral area, talk about opportunities and strategies, and then one of the other elements that we really don't do well is celebrate our successes. It's something that the US does very well with their media, with their movie stars and others, and people really like to watch that. We might find that a bit cheesy for a lack of a better word, but we have to also find our way to embrace some of that and celebrate the work that we're doing and bring people together to advance that. So EC3 is that mechanism to try and foster change at the larger scale to really force market transformation. Uh, let's talk about something that maybe isn't quite as uh, optimistic or cheery right now, and, and that's the pace of change. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems that there are so many market leaders like Walmart and Interface and other major companies we just have no problem seeing the business case mm -hmm. for sustainability plans. Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, studies show that we're still, broadly speaking, just not moving the dial yet. Mm -hmm. So why do you think the pace is so slow and, and, and how do we get to the point where sustainability plans are just standard operating sure. procedure? Well, I think there's a number of answers for that. There's not any one specific thing that we can pinpoint. But we look at it from a psychological standpoint and the way we are as a human species. We're a species of generational change. We don't do things very quickly. But when it comes to asking someone to change your lifestyle, doing that within a generation is very difficult. So that's part of the problem is how do we encourage someone that doesn't understand quite the importance of the issues that the UN are telling us around uh, populations going from 6.5 to 9 billion by people by 2050. The CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere are getting very intense. The resources that we have with all the populations coming on the planet are getting to the point where, for example, uh, food and agriculture. They're telling us with 9 billion people coming on the planet, the amount of land that we're going to need to feed them we need land the size of Brazil. That land does not exist on this planet. That's right. So how do we figure out a way to, to adopt new change? And again, because of our psychological predisposition, we tend not to embrace things, especially when it makes us nervous. Now you look at, as you talked about Walmart Interface, and actually I know Ray Anderson of Interface fairly well. And it's not something they've gone into very quickly. And in fact, you know, Ray specifically has had a lot of problems at the beginning with his board of directors and others to try and get everybody on board with what his strategies and mindset is. Same thing with Walmart. It was small steps first. Try not to get caught up in issues and try and just go for the, the low hanging fruit, the quick hits to see what's possible. And I think that the ability to allow change to happen in, a, in the proper process, but still understand that change has to happen quickly we don't have that answer yet, so it's going to be interesting to see over the next few years how we start addressing international issues. And you know, speaking of another uh, human characteristic, skepticism. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about the word green, and studies show that up to 75% of consumers uh, really think that whenever they hear that, it's, it's simply a marketing ploy. So yeah. there's so much skepticism, and even about climate change itself. So. How do we get to the point where, where consumers believe and are willing to trust? Yeah. And I think it's interesting because when you started asking that question, all of a sudden I went back to a, a memory about four years ago 
when green started becoming very popular. In fact, it was rivaling economics in politics. And I said, uh-oh, because that's exactly where we get ourselves stuck into something where we latch onto it and it becomes huge. But as a species, we get very tired of things quickly. Green, and at least what green stands for, I don't like the word anymore because it's been overused, it's, it's been used to death in marketing and whatever, but for lack of a better term right now, green um, you know, really needs to be something beyond just, you know, look at me, I, I'm doing something better for the planet. It needs to become that tool for change, and it needs to become systemic and uh, embedded in the efforts that we do, and there needs to be opportunities to showcase and develop results, uh, financial opportunities, um, independence uh, with a family, you, you name it, whatever the thing is that, that, that creates an opportunity for you to better your, your lifestyle, the elements of what green is about have to become a part of that naturally. And we don't know how to do that yet because we're still of that mindset of economic growth. We're about building. We're about producing. We have to figure out a way to develop an economy based on even development. So what you take away, you put back. And I think that the problems with the environment and the problems with the economy, they mix. You can't separate the two. Mm -hmm. And when someone says something that, about green or, or look at me, I'm green or whatever, you know, they, they are definitely pulling on something of, of public acceptance of, of the common language that we need to get beyond. So for me, what I like to do is talk about low carbon economics. Let's look at something that we know we can change. We know we can potentially reduce our carbon footprint. We know that buildings, for example, 40% of carbon emissions come off of buildings and infrastructure. Can we create buildings that are greener and in the same pace can we make sure the people that are building the buildings have economic opportunities? Mm -hmm. We can't ask someone to do something because it's the right thing to do, because we have too many people on this planet that would go against that. Exactly. Right? One final question. Um, there are a number of high-profile uh, projects that, that are being developed across Canada, mm -hmm. and you can talk about a couple of them, but it seems that these successes of showing that we are on the road to the green economy mm -hmm. just are not making it into public awareness. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's the case and, and how do you think we change that so we get them into the mainstream and, yeah. and people can feel fortified that this is actually happening? Sure. Yeah, that's one of my, my issues right now is that when you're looking at some of these great projects, you look at the mechanisms that actually put them in place. So one of the projects that I worked on that I'm very proud of is a project called the Archetype House and the Toronto Region Conservation Authority uh, initiated this and it's a partnership with the Home Builders Association in Ontario called BUILD. It was a great partnership and it's now built up at the Courtright Centre just north of Toronto. But the profile was around putting that project in place and the buzz was around that part but now that it's built what do they do with it and how do they celebrate the success so it gets used properly after the fact. And again it's that psychological indifference that we have that we get tired of things very quickly. And I think that people need to start understanding how to use these projects more effectively, how to celebrate each other's successes. Um, you know, for example, I just did a tour of the new West uh, University of Ontario um, Automotive Center of Excellence. One of their questions to me is how can I help them get the word out about it? Mm -hmm. We don't have a really strong mechanism to tell people about these, these good news stories. So again, EC3 is trying to develop a protocol and a strategy to celebrate through third party uh, mechanisms to celebrate all these successes and, and find a way to bring everybody together and understand these more, to use them, to get more confidence mm -hmm. and, and develop new opportunity. Yeah, a big PR challenge yes, in other exactly, words. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for giving us the time this evening. It's always interesting to talk to you. Pleasure. It's great. And we'll be keeping Pleasure, in touch. Wendy. That was great. Thank <laughs> you very much.